Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, New Middle Grade Series. I'm Ronnie Curry, Associate Editor, Books for You. Before we begin, I would like to go over some technical details. To resize the slides, look to the magnifying glass icons located to the left of the slides. There, you can increase or decrease the size and select how you'd like the slides to appear. If you lose audio or would like to change the way you're connected to it, look at the bottom of your screen for a circle with three dots. Clicking that icon will open a menu with an audio connection option. If you're in the audience, you are in listen-only mode, but we do welcome any questions you might have. On the right side of your screen is a control panel with an area at the bottom for Q&A. Simply type your question into the field and click Send. Attendees can see questions asked during the webinar as well as the answers provided. Links to today's slides were sent directly to you from WebEx at the start of the webinar, but you can also download them at any time by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive a follow-up email containing links to today's slide presentation, certificate of completion, and video recording. And so today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Michael Buckley, author of the Finiverse series, Dr. Theanne Griffith, author of the Magnificent Maker series, Kate Messner, author of the History Smasher series, and Kenneth Opal, author of the Overthrow series. And first up, we will hear from Michael Buckley. Michael is the New York Times bestselling author of the Sisters Grimm and Nerd series, and the co-creator, writer, and executive producer of Cartoon Network's Robotomy. Finn and the Intergalactic Lunchbox is the first in his newest series for middle grade readers. He lives in New York City, Welcome, Michael. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to just thank everybody for registering for the event. And I see uh, that the participant number is going up. So that's very exciting. Um, I think that if we had 891 people at a panel in real life, I would be a little bit afraid. Um, so thank you all again. Like you said, my name is Michael Buckley. I'm uh, uh, predominantly known as a middle grade author. And um, my newest series is called The Finiverse. Uh, the first book is called Finn and the Intergalactic Lunchbox. It's about a, a boy who um, has a pink rainbow-covered glittery unicorn lunchbox that happens to open wormholes. Um, and a wormhole is kind of like a tunnel, and uh, he can use them to go anywhere in the universe that he wants to go. Uh, unfortunately, using it, has drawn the attention of an evil race of giant bugs known as the plague. Um, the lunchbox technology is actually theirs and they want it back. So they're heading to earth um, to get it and take over the planet, eat all of its resources. And of course, Finn and his friends have to save the world. And Finn's friends are a girl named Julep Lee, um, a kid named Lincoln Sedona, who was actually his biggest bully for a while, and a seven-foot glitchy robot named High Beam from a planet called Nemeth. Um, I had the best time writing this. It was so much fun, and I'm excited to get it out there and, and get readers excited. I think it's the first, I mean, I think it's the, the kind of book that those cooped up kids who are bored to death really need right now. And um, I hope you guys all agree. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. And next up, we will hear from Theanne Griffith. Theanne can't get you into the maker maze because only Dr. Crisp can do that. But she can tell you a lot of cool science facts. And that is because she is an actual brain scientist by day and a storyteller by night. She loves tinkering in the lab as much as she loves writing children's books. She lives in New Jersey with her family and three cats. Take it away, Theanne. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you again to everyone at Booklist and Random House for inviting me. 
Um, I am actually a debut author, so The Magnificent Makers is my first series that I will be publishing. Um, so I'll take a few moments just to tell everyone a little bit about myself. Um, as Ronnie just told you, I am a neuroscientist. I currently work at Rutgers University. And since I was a little girl, I've always been really passionate about two things, science and storytelling. And for the majority of my life, professionally, I've pursued a science career. I got my bachelor's um, in neuroscience and then went on to get a PhD in neuroscience and currently run um, a research program on sensory neuroscience. But I've always been an avid reader and I've always loved writing and storytelling. And so a few years ago, I decided to combine my passion for science and science education, as well as writing and pursued a career as a children's book author in addition to my science career. And the first project that will be hitting the shelves is this wonderful chapter book series that I'm really proud of. Again, it's called Magnificent Makers. Uh, books one and two, How to Test a Friendship and Brain Trouble, will be releasing in just a few weeks. And these, this series follows best friends, Violet and Pablo, on these kind of out of this world adventures into what is called uh, the Maker Maze. And the Maker Maze is kind of a magical maker space where all your science dreams can come true and you can learn about all different types of cool science. And they're accompanied um, on their adventures in the Maker Maze by a kind of kooky uh, maze scientist called Dr. Chris. And in each book, they learn about a different science topic and they go on a science challenge that is divided into three levels. And they have to complete the challenge within 120 maker minutes or they're not allowed to come back. And so there's always kind of a race to the finish uh, through, throughout the book. And as I mentioned, each book covers a different science topic. So book one is all about ecosystems and the food chain. Book two is about brain trouble. Sorry, that's the name of the book. Book two is all about the brain um, and learning about what the brain does and the different parts. And then I also have a third book in the series that is going that will be released in September that's all about the senses. And so, um, as I mentioned, in each book, they go on all of these um, very kind of fun and exciting adventures, and they have to make something while they're in the Maker Maze to help them complete one of the challenges. And a cool thing about these books is that at the very end of each, they come with two do-it-at-home or do-it-yourself maker activities. So I think they're really ideal now, considering we're all a bit cooped up. Um, they kind of come with these built-in activities for parents to do with their kids, um, or you know, hopefully when we're back in school, for teachers and librarians to do with their students. Perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Deanne. And next up, we have Kate Messner. Kate lives on Lake Champlain with her family. Her books have been New York Times Notable, Junior Library Guild, Indie Bound, and Bank Street Best Books selections. Her novel, The Brilliant Fall of Gianna Z, won the E.B. White Read Aloud Award. And her science picture books have been finalists for the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, Subaru SBNF Prize for Excellence in Science Writing. Before becoming a full-time writer, Kate was a TV news reporter as well as an educator who spent 15 years teaching middle school English. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kate. Thank you so much. And I'm um, so excited to be here to talk about History Smashers. But first, can I just say thanks to everybody for joining us? And more than that, for all the work that you have been doing, I have heard so many stories from families about how teachers and librarians have been checking in on kids and connecting families to the resources they need. You all are just continuing to be the hearts of your school and library communities through all of this. And you deserve a big shout out for that. So thank you from me. And, and I think I can speak for more than just myself on that one. You've been amazing. So about History Smashers, um, this is a series that is aimed at undoing the lies and the myths we tend to teach little kids about history. Um, when I was growing up in Western New York, I learned all the traditional stories, America's founding myths, how the pilgrims came on the Mayflower and they landed at Plymouth Rock and set up their new colony. 
But nobody ever told me that they had tried to come on another ship first, a ship called the Speedwell that was so leaky they had to keep turning back over and over and over again and eventually just give up on it and get on the Mayflower. Um, nobody told me about some of the less well-known characters. I learned about William Bradford and William Brewster, but I never heard about, say, William Mullins, who brought 250 pairs of shoes and 13 pairs of boots with him on the Mayflower. He won the, the Didn't Pack Light Award in the History Smashers book. By the way, he wasn't a fashionista. He was a shoemaker. Uh, I didn't learn about John Howland, the servant who fell off the Mayflower and went overboard until he grabbed this rope that was dangling behind the ship and just held on for dear life until some sailors saw him and yanked him back on board with a boat hook. And uh, I also never learned that Plymouth Rock, that famous rock behind the glass where all the tour buses stop in Plymouth, is probably not at all where the pilgrims landed. There's no evidence at all that the pilgrims ever set foot on that very famous rock. So this series is aimed at busting some of those myths um, and also looking at what the historical documents say. So just as an example, I wanna read you a little excerpt, one of the sidebars from uh, History Smashers Mayflower. It's called, Did Pilgrims Really Look Like That? Chances are you've seen pictures of pilgrims dressed all in black with fancy buckles on their hats. Maybe when you were in preschool or kindergarten, you even made a hat like that out of construction paper and aluminum foil and wore it for your classroom's Thanksgiving celebration. But most of the time, pilgrims didn't dress like that at all. This is a situation where mythology, the stories told about a group of people, was accepted as history without proof. Often modern people think of pilgrims as being super strict and stern and dressing all in black. There are portraits of pilgrims dressed in black, like the one of Edward Winslow in this book. It's the only portrait of a pilgrim painted from life, with the subject sitting there while the artist painted, and Winslow is indeed wearing black, but that's probably because people wore their best clothes to have their portraits made, and in the time of the pilgrims, most people's best clothes were black. Paintings like this make it easy for people to assume that pilgrims walked around in black clothes all the time, but historical documents tell a different story. An estate inventory is a listing of a person's possessions. It includes all the things they owned at the time of their death. If that myth about pilgrims wearing all black were true, you'd expect the estate listings from Plymouth Colony to be a long list of black pants and black coats. But instead, those documents list articles of clothing in all kinds of bright colors, red, yellow, orange, green, and violet, in addition to brown and black. So when we look at historical documents, we see that the Pilgrim's world was probably a lot more colorful than many people thought. So this series is really about challenging those myths with actual historical documents. And it was really amazing to dig deep into those documents and do that work. And of course, uh, part of this story is the story that was left out when many of us learned about the pilgrims uh, when we were kids, and that is the story of the Wampanoag people who had um, had their homeland uh, in the area of Plymouth for thousands of years before the pilgrims uh, ever arrived. So this series is aimed at undoing some of those myths. Uh, the Mayflower uh, deals with the pilgrims and the Wampanoag people, and then women's right to vote deals with a lot of the myths of the suffrage movement and some little known facts like did you know that women in New Jersey had the right to vote until it got taken away in 1807? Uh, or that many of our earliest suffragists, some of our favorites, exhibited, exhibited huge amounts of racism even as they were fighting for women's right to vote. So uh, this is a, a book, a series about undoing some of the myths and revealing some, uh, some of those hidden truths as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, our last um, introduction will come from Kenneth Opal. Kenneth is one of the most highly regarded authors of middle grade fiction writing today. Some of his best known titles are Inkling, The Nest, Airborne, the 2005 Prince Honor book, and Silverwing. The Overthrow series is his newest and most thrilling series yet. Take it away, Kenneth. Hello. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. 
So over the course of my career, I've written about uh, a number of, of um, fascinating things, uh, bats and airships, talking chimpanzees. Um, I've written about giant trains um, and evil wasps. So in the Overthrow series, I thought I'd try my hand at really, really mean plants. So as Bloom opens, it's springtime on Salt Spring Island in British Columbia. And this is not a good time for my 15-year-old hero, Anaya, because she suffers from terrible seasonal allergies. She wakes up with her eyes glued shut. She sneezes uh, constantly. She has puffy eyes and a runny nose. She has allergy-induced asthma, um, lots of food restrictions. She, she has skin sensitivities. Uh, that lead to acne, and so she's pretty self-conscious about her appearance and the limitations her allergies impose on her life in, in general. And as the story opens, there's a huge downpour on the island, and when Anaya returns home from school, she sees uh, something growing from this dead patch in their front lawn where nothing has ever grown, not ever. It's a thick shoot of black grass. It's um, already a full foot tall. It's really spiky. It absolutely wasn't there when she left for school. Um, in the morning, but now she sees this stuff all over the island. And in just 24 hours, uh, this stuff is six feet tall. Um, it's taking over people's lawns and farmers' fields. And when it reaches its full height, it produces this beautiful bloom that literally sprays out pollen. And everyone on the island is, is terribly allergic to this pollen, except Anaya, this girl who's allergic to basically half the planet. Um, it doesn't even make her sneeze. And as it turns out, there, there are two other kids in my story, Petra and Seth, who aren't allergic. There's Anaya's ex-best friend, Petra, who actually has an allergy of her own. Um, her allergy is water. It's a very rare allergy, uh, a very uh, serious one. Um, and she's actually caught in that big downpour that opens my story, and she's absolutely fine. Normally, when she gets hit with water, she breaks out in, in hives and a terrible rash. And this rainwater does nothing to her. And the third hero is, is a boy called Seth, who's being fostered by a um, family of organic farmers on Salt Spring Island. And not only is he not allergic to the black grass's pollen, he's immune to the smoke the grass makes when it's burned. And a lot of farmers especially are trying to burn this grass to get it off their farmland. But Seth is, is, is fine um, when he breathes in these fumes. So no one's seen anything like this uh, grass before. You can chop it down. It's just you know, back the next morning, spray it with any herbicide you want. It has no effect. It just doesn't die. And by now, the spread is worldwide. It's not just on the island. So no one knows where this stuff has come from, and people are finger-pointing in the media um, and wondering if it's bioterrorism. And there's worries about, you know, looming food shortages because it, it literally crowds out every crop um, that's being grown. And a lot of people are getting sick because, um, you know, their allergies are so bad they have complications. Um, but Anaya and Petra and Seth are actually feeling better than ever, um, and they think this is very strange. And when more new plants begin to appear, um, they're immune to them as well. I've got lots of uh, deliciously terrible plants um, in the book. There's a, there's a vine that uh, exudes a, um, a sleeping gas, and it likes growing inside people's houses, perhaps um, down their nostrils and strangling them. Um, my personal favorite is a, a pod plant. Um, sort of like a Venus flytrap that grows underground and it just waits for prey to walk overhead. It might be a squirrel, it could be a, um, a deer, it could be a human, um, and the prey falls into the pit plant. The pit plant closes and dissolves its prey with acid. But again, uh, Anaya, Petra, and Seth are not harmed by this acid at all. And by this time in the story, my kids are coming under a lot of attention um, because everyone wonders, what's so special about them? And they are quickly transported to a, a military research institute in Vancouver where they're going to be studied to see if, you know, maybe a medicine or a vaccine can be made based on their, you know, genetic material. So my three heroes are going to learn a lot more about these plants. Um, what are they? Where they came from? Um, and they also uh, learn some very disturbing things about them themselves. So that is the kickoff to the Overthrow series with uh, the first title, Bloom. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And now we are going to open the floor for a little Q&A with Michael, Sian, Kate, and Kenneth. Um, so there's already questions coming in through the chat. We thank you for that. Um, keep them coming. Um, and I'm going to kick it off with a question for everybody. So I will kind of guide the answers down the line. Um, 
but my starting question is, this webinar is part of a series spotlighting middle grade books. But as evidenced by this panel, uh, middle grade spans a pretty wide range of age groups and interests. So can you describe the ideal reader for your series? In other words, who are you writing for? And we can, um, we'll go in reverse order, so we'll start um, with Kenneth. Um, I would say the ideal reader for for the Bloom series is uh, is ten and up. Um, I imagined, yeah, someone in grade five, six um, could easily read this right into YA. Um, it's kind of hard for me to pin down. I'm, I certainly don't think of these things when I'm writing the book. Um, so I certainly have heard from from readers who are both, you know, like as, as young as eight reading it and as old as sort of fifteen. Interesting. Yeah, there were some questions coming in about um, people kind of hearing that it fits into middle grade and a little bit into YA. Um, as a follow-up, so you've you've written on both sides of, of that line in middle grade and YA. So um, for you, do you do you do you think about that when you're writing, and and where do you think the line is between the two age groups? To me, the line is arbitrary. I mean, I I don't think it even used to exist. There were just books for young readers. Um, and what was read was pretty much, you know, self-determined by the reader. I feel like, you know, as the industry grew and especially as, as widely exploded, um, you know, these distinctions were kind of like forced upon us all, um, you know, because people needed to know, like, where am I going to shelve the books and, and, and the reading level and the maturity level. Um, but honestly, when I, when I write a book, um, I, I'm just trying to tell the best story I can. And I'm not really, I'm not really that interested in pinning it down. And certainly, you know, over the course of my career, I've, I've, uh, I've, I feel like I have enjoyed a pretty broad readership, you know, both, you know, uh, both, you know, um, uh, male and female and from, you know, anywhere from like, you know, six years old for, you know, a really fluent reader to, um, you know, teenagers and up to, up to 16, certainly for the airborne books. Um, so I try, <laughs> I try to, I try to willfully ignore these distinctions uh, when I'm writing. <laughs> Very good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, we'll, we'll move on to you with the same question. Um, who are you writing for? Um, what's your, who's your ideal reader here? I think the ideal reader for History Smashers are those kids who love history, but especially kids who like to be in on secrets. Um, and we've, we've all, you know, known those kids. I gave birth to two of them uh, and was one myself. But the kid who likes to sit down at the dinner table and say, hey, I bet you didn't know this about the Pilgrims or I bet you didn't know this about Susan B. Anthony. I think uh, this is going to be a fun book for, for families to talk about together and for students and teachers and librarians to talk about together, too, um, just because there's so much uh, unknown history that's uh, that's revealed here. So probably ages 8 to 12, those kids who love history and being in on the secret. And I think this is also a series that's going to appeal to some of your graphic novel fans because it is very heavily illustrated, um, including with some graphic sequences by Dylan McConus, who's just an amazing comic book and uh, artist and graphic novelist. So I think, I think it's going to appeal to a pretty wide range of readers. For sure. And for adults as well, I can, I can attest to that. Um, <laughs> and Kate, um, kind of going back to the age range sort of question, um, why is it that you think children often aren't trusted with, with the whole truth of history, um, especially in American history? Is it, um, does it have to do with their age or is there kind of something else going on there? Oh, I think it has to do with a few different things. Um, first of all, I think sometimes we don't give kids enough credit to be honest with them. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a, a teacher for 15 years, and um, I, in my experience, kids were always ready for, for more than we thought they were ready for and, and could have some of the most thoughtful discussions about history and flawed heroes and things like that. Uh, so part of it, I think, is underestimating kids. Uh, but the other part of it, I think, is, um, you know, some of these stories that we, we tend to lie about and mythologize are America's founding myths. And sometimes we lean toward patriotism and away from facts when we talk about things like colonization. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that we are honest with kids about history. We're raising citizens after all. And that's just really important to understand where we've come from so that we can end up somewhere better. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I will forward the, the initial question along uh, to Deanne. Um, so again, 
your ideal reader? Who are you writing for? So these books are geared for kids um, ages 7 to 10, but I will say that they could be enjoyed um, as read aloud by uh, kids as young as six, I think, and definitely could probably extend up into maybe, you know, sixth grade because the science, I, I worked very hard with my editor um, and the team at Random House to make sure that the science was accessible and still exciting. And I think we were able to craft it in such a way that it can be easily digestible for younger readers, as well as still entertaining and exciting and new for the older readers. And I would say that these are definitely science-themed books, um, but, you know, there's a plot and a story that's driving them. So even if, you know, a child is not, their dream is not to become a famous scientist or an astronaut or whatever, you know, when they grow up, I still think that they're going to um, find a lot of fun and excitement and adventure. And that's actually a topic that I touch upon a little bit in book two, um, there's a little bit of tension between one of the main characters, Violet, and um, and one of the assembly um, ensemble characters, uh, Skylar, who's much more into art. And they learn that there's a lot of overlap between the arts and the sciences, and that scientists actually use art all the time. And um, with these books, you know, I just really want to foster not just a love for science in the traditional sense of learning facts or anything like that, but just getting kids curious teaching them how to ask questions and teaching them how to answer questions in kind of a fact and science based manner, which is probably more important today than it has ever been. For sure. And we had one question come um, from our audience um, asking how you went about balancing the science versus the storytelling component. It was really tough. And as a scientist, you know, I spend most of my life thinking about, you know, science. Initially, in my very early draft, I was definitely putting the science first. And I realized that that is not what, you know, fiction books are, are about. You know, this isn't a nonfiction series. This is definitely a fiction series. So I, it was really important to me as I was editing and revising to learn how to put the characters first and build the science as kind of like the backdrop, like the world that they, you know, move through is this kind of scientific world, but that the dynamics between the characters and the life lessons that they learn while they're in the maker maze are kind of what's moving the story forward. And indeed, within each book, in addition to a science topic, um, there's also kind of a, a kind of life lesson, if you will. So um, in book one, Pablo has to get used to the fact that there's this new kid, Deepak, who he feels a little bit intimidated by and learning to deal with new friends. In book two, um, they learn that they need to work as a team if they're ever going to get out of the maker maze and be able to come back. So there's kind of the theme of teamwork. Um, and in book three, we have introduced a character who has sensory processing disorder. And so just learning that people have, um, you know, differences and different talents and appreciating those differences. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and we'll slide over to Michael, um, your ideal reader. Who are you writing for? You mentioned cooped up kids. <laughs> you know, I think the kid I'm writing for is myself. Um, I was a, a bit of a reluctant reader when I was a kid, and uh, and I, you know, I don't want to blame the, the well-meaning adults in my life, but they kept shoving books in my hands that had these really heavy-handed moral lessons that felt more like a lecture than a story. So whenever I was given a book, it was almost it almost felt like a punishment, and. Um, it wasn't until I was in the fourth grade when the school librarian noticed I wasn't much of a reader and she gave me a copy of The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary. And it, I had never um, read it. I didn't know anything about it. She sort of forced me to read it. And and um, I will say that I loved it. Um, I kept it. I'm not even sure I took the book back to the school library. I'm sorry. But, but I fell in love with that book. And, because it, it really had the three key elements for me as a reluctant reader. One, it was it was a very funny book, and two, it was a big adventure. Uh, but three, it was completely pointless. I mean, I wasn't supposed to 
to become a better person after reading this book. And that is what I wanted. I just wanted something that would make me smile, maybe make me laugh, like stimulate my imagination and take me away from the problems of an old fourth grade year old boy. And, and um, so when I sit down to write my book, I, I try to think of that kid and what I wanted and what everybody was giving me and um, try to be that kid's mouse on the motorcycle to the best that I can. So I, I'd say, you know, my sweet spot audience <clears throat> is somewhere between 8 and 12, though, you know, I can't help but slip in a bunch of jokes that only grown-ups are going to get. Um, and uh, But that's just that's my style. And but, you know, like, I guess what I'm saying is, like, the mouse on the motorcycle was kind of like a hug for me, if a book can be a hug. And um, that's what I needed. And so that's what I'm trying to do myself is is be a hug. Yeah, there's no, you can't overvalue, the, you know, reading um, for comfort or for entertainment. Um, reading for pleasure is so important. And I feel like that gets overlooked sometimes. Um, so, Michael, can you, can we back up and just talk about, um, the inspiration for your general idea of the Finiverse and an intergalactic lunchbox. Um, I think that, that hook alone is, is, is joyful, so I, I'd love to hear about it. Thanks. I, um, well, I think it, it all sparked, really. I, I had never read um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, until a few years ago. Um, but somehow this book had eluded me. And, um, I, you know, when I was finished with it, I sat it down and I was like, that is so perfect. I mean, it's, it's silly and it's smart and it's like Monty Python and all the funny Mel Brooks things that I love. But there was a real uh, kind of really curious sci-fi story as well. And um, so that it was like sitting there, you know, in my head and, and I was having a conversation with my girlfriend and she said that she was talking about how our mother always packed her lunch. And I, and I got on this little tangent about uh, what a terrible cook my mom is. I, I love her to death, bless her heart, but she's terrible, terrible cook. <laughs> Sometimes I would wind up at school and there'd be like a mayonnaise and pickle sandwich or something equally horrific. And so like opening that lunchbox every day was a surprise. Sometimes the surprise was good and sometimes it was bad. But I realized it's like that's kind of an experience that a lot of kids have that lunchtime opening that lunchbox what is going to be there and that was the spark that got it all started and then of course my son whose name is finn um he's 12 and you know he's read most of what i've written and he's looked through it and seen all of his friends names popping up in the books you know because that's what you do you, you steal everybody's names and um he was like when when is the book going to be about me and um, and I, I had fully intended on writing a book for him, but I, you know it was always this thought that I was saving the the good book, the like the the one I, I was really going to save a great one for him. And this seemed like the perfect book to name after him. So it was a bunch of different uh, inspirations, but it all came together. I suppose that's how a good book uh, actually gets made. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic gift for, for Finn as well. I love that. Um, so let's see. I'm going to kick off another sort of everybody question. Um, since we're talking about series, um, I'm curious about the process of writing a series as a whole. We, we get to ask a lot about um, individual books usually, um, but I wonder if you can each talk a little bit about kind of planning out or plotting a, a bigger um, structure. Um, and let us begin this time um, with Theanne. Hello? Hello. Can you hear sorry. me? Sorry. Yes, I'm talk? sorry. My computer was cutting out. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely, yeah. So we're, I'm, I'm kind of turning the focus to constructing a series as opposed to an individual book. Um, so I wonder if you can speak a little bit about um, planning multiple books um, ahead of time, um, and you can get into how you picked your topics, perhaps. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. So um, for me, for this level and for um, these books, the the kind of beats are very similar for for each story. So in the beginning of the story, they get a riddle from Dr. Chris, and that riddle, once they solve it, allows them to go through this magical portal, and then they're transported to the Maker Maze. And in the Maker Maze, they do a challenge, and then there are three levels to each challenge, and they kind of go through them. Again, it's always a bit of a race against time. And then they finally make it out, you know, by the skin of their teeth, and then they're so glad that they went on that adventure. So that's basically how most of the books are set up. And then what's changing, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be the science topic, as well as the kind of life lesson that they learn in each book. And so when I was choosing science topics, it was really important for me to choose a, a topic that would be relevant um, and exciting, not just for kids, but also for the teachers and librarians. So I actually just, when I was doing some of my research, you know, went and checked to see what second, third, fourth, and fifth graders were learning about in school. The one exception to that is going to be the brain, which, uh, you know, much to my chagrin as a neuroscientist and a lover of everything nervous system, most, you know, schools don't have the brain or neuroscience on their curriculum. I, at least when I was growing up, I didn't learn about, you know, neuroscience in a very complete way until I was a junior in high school. So that would be maybe the one exception. But when I was looking at topics and thinking about topics, you know, I wanted to kind of bridge the balance between something that would be exciting for children, but something that would really be useful in the classroom or even at home for, for parents or for homeschooling parents, um, for them to kind of, kind of kill two birds with one stone, both cover certain um, literacy needs as well as um, science topics. So that's really how I was choosing um, uh, what I wanted to write about. And then again, I kind of crafted them with this basic setup of the kids go into the maze, they go through these challenges, they're really, you know, having fun, but also kind of getting to some kind of mini conflict along the way that they then have to resolve that isn't necessarily science related, but kind of a little bit of a, a life lesson in there. Yeah. And so um, I believe your series is launching with two books, is that right? Correct. Two books, uh, How to Test a Friendship and Brain Trouble are the first two. And so, and we had an audience question of, do you think um, readers need to read them in any order? No, I, I'm, I mean, I did a good, I tried to do my best such that there's a little bit of a reintroducing of the characters and a reintroducing of the context um, and like the maker maze and all of the rules kind of in the beginning of each book. The first book obviously has the most kind of detailed explanation, but I don't think that it's necessary to read them in chronological order in order to understand kind of the world in which they're operating. I was really conscious of making sure that there's some explanation of why things are the way they are or who Dr. Crisp is or what a magnificent maker watches, <laughs> kind of all of these <laughs> little tidbits that I threw in there. So I don't really think there's a need to read them in, in order. But with that said, book one does have the most, I spend the most time setting up the world in book one. Great. And we had another audience question for you as well. Somebody who um, was enjoying the idea of the 120 minute time limit. Um, I wonder, if, is there any uh, specific inspiration behind that? No, I, it was just one of those days I was sitting behind my computer and I thought, what would be a nice, uh, so in science, we kind of have this rule of three. And I was like, I need something that's nice and divisible by three. I'm like, oh, 120, that's 40 minutes per challenge. That sounds about, you know, realistic. The, the, the scientist in me kind of battles between <laughs> keeping things somewhat realistic and allowing, you know, creativity to take over. So that's a little bit how I chose the 120, but it wasn't too, it's not overly significant. <laughs> okay, awesome. But it does add some stakes to the, to the story. Yeah, thank you for the questions, <laughs> audience members. <laughs> Let's uh, shift over to Kenneth. Um, and so you're, you're writing fiction, um, and I, I believe it's a planned trilogy. So um, how do you go about sort of setting that up? Um, from the get-go? Well, this was unusual for me because in my other series, I would just write one book at a time and think I was all done. 
and I was happy, you know, with the way the book ended. And um, I would wait until I got a really good, or what I thought was a really good idea for a, for a follow-up. And I think that is the sane way to write a series. This one, <laughs> this one was different because it presented itself to me as, as, as a trilogy. Um, so it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because every book is sort of like writing three books because you're constantly aware of all the interlocking parts. Um, so when I was, you know, rewriting the second or writing the second book, um, I was also rewriting the first one and you go, going back and forward um, to make sure everything, everything meshes. Um, and it's a good thing in a way because it's sort of like an extra sort of layer of editing where you get to, uh, you know, test drive your, your books. But it's a lot of story um, to, to, to juggle. So I found that quite, quite challenging. Um, it seemed like such a good idea at the time, you know, to, to do it this way. Um, and because it, it did, the story idea presented itself to me is uh, it's basically each book is a different uh, kind of invasion. So it's sort of a three-pronged overthrow that's taking place um, on, on the planet. Um, and they're very distinct um, invasions, each, each one, um, but they're all, of course, they're all unified um, by the, uh, you know, the perpetrator um, of the invasion. Um, so it was, just, it was just a lot of juggling. It was a lot of balls to keep in the air. Um, so it, sort of kept, it certainly kept me on my toes. Uh, but I think, I don't know that I'd do it again. I think I just, I think standalones are a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I agree. Um, getting at um, a little bit of your inspiration, this comes partially from me and partially from the audience and blending questions. Um, I would ask it as, when did you realize plants are so horrifying? Um, and kind of where that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, part of it just came, I mean, part, one, of the, one of the seeds, uh, ha, 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 uh, that was on the <laughs> story was the sentence I'd had banging around in my head um, that I'd written down in one of my ideas notebooks. It was a pretty simple sentence. It just went, there was a dead patch in the garden where nothing grew. I just liked that sentence and I wrote it down and nothing really happened with it for a couple of years. Um, but then it occurred to me, you know, what would happen if something did start growing in that dead patch? You know, what would it be? How come it was allowed to grow when nothing else did? What would it be like? Um, so I did, I did start with the idea of some, you know, strange and monstrous plant growing. Um, but once I knew I was committed to plants as my antagonist, I do, like I always do a lot of research, even if it's a fantasy or a, you know, a thriller, I, I want to make sure I have, a, I have a foundation of fact um, that I'm building my story on. So I was lucky enough to have a friend who's a botanist. Um, and he assured me that really uh, plants can be very terrifying. Um, I mean, they wage chemical warfare on each other. Um, they communicate through the soil, you know, through the rhizomes. Um, and um, there are there are invasive species on our planet that are you know basically impossible to manage and eradicate. Um, so in fact, you know the world of Avatar, which was this sort of uh, you know plant-based communication system, he said that's actually more true than not. Um, and he uh, advised me and gave me some ideas and drew pictures for me of my alien plants. So I had a lot of uh, a lot of help in designing my my horrifying plants. Yeah, um, and they are horrifying. Uh, there, there's been some appreciation um, that um, the characters have allergies. I wonder if it was that a reaction to the plant idea or did that come from somewhere else? Um, I think, I think the, where the allergy came from is I really like the idea of uh, uh, my main characters, especially Anaya, um, having, uh, being so stricken and feeling so constrained by these allergies um, and then they disappear. Um, and I like that as a reversal character of how, you know, a weakness can become strength. It's sort of a classic ugly duckling story. It's like, well, no, you, you were never ugly. You were just something completely different. Um, so the allergy, the allergy um, angle isn't, isn't based on, you know, personal experience or, or anything. Um, I, you know, I, I have the standard seasonal allergy, the trees and grass, and that's about it. Well, that's something. <laughs> My little <laughs> contribution. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to Michael. Um, so you've written series before, but can you talk about um, the kind of putting the arc together for the Finiverse? Um, well, it, you know, I, I'm trying to keep things a little loosey goosey. I never really start anything until I know how it's going to end. 
So for instance, in the Sisters Grimm series, I knew I knew the ending before I but before I even got started. A lot of the things in the middle um, changed, but but I I need to feel like I have a, a destination. Um, but in this case, you know, I had kind of an interesting problem. Um, a couple of years ago, um, a movie called um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the premise is that uh, a, a Spider-Man from a different universe um, teams up with a bunch of other spider people to save um, everyone. And um, it was, I went to see it because I love Spider-Man and uh, I just sat there with my jaw dropped open because it was almost scene for scene the exact same plot of the second Finn book. Um, mm -hmm. And that movie was spectacular and, it, and like I just can't be the guy that's that's ripping off something else, even if I feel like I thought of it first. Um, I just don't want to be a follower. I want to be a leader. So uh, in this case, I had to completely devise a, uh, an all new second book, um, which turned out to be pretty challenging. So, you know, I'd like to speak on how I do it. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say it was a little bit by the seat of my pants. Um, but it does keep things interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, that's great to hear, um, given that you've you've written some fabulous series before. Um, let's go uh, to Kate. Um, so Kate, a lot of same question about about putting a series together and picking your subjects, and I imagine there are were plenty of possible subjects that you could have picked from. Um, and there's also a lot of questions about your research process and what, uh, what it went into that. Yeah, so with the History Smasher series, the problem is too many ideas rather than too few. And it's also a little bit different uh, than dealing with a fiction series where you're, you know, thinking about uh, characters and a character arc. The History Smashers books really stand on their own. So it was a matter of figuring out, you know, what do we want to tackle first? What do there seem to be the most misconceptions about in uh, American history and world history? So we settled on the Mayflower and women's right to vote for the first two books, um, largely because there are so many uh, myths surrounding those historical topics, but also because uh, 2020 is an anniversary for both of those. We're looking at the, the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower landing and the 100th anniversary of white women uh, getting the right to vote with the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, so those are the first two books. Um, and then from there, we've got actually a total of six books on the, the schedule already. Uh, the book three coming out this fall will be about Pearl Harbor, uh, which is something that many kids learn about in history. I know I did growing up, but what I didn't learn about was the aftermath and the um, imprisonment of Japanese Americans after. Uh, book. Uh, three, uh, no, book four will be about the Titanic, the myths surrounding that. Uh, book five is about the American Revolution. And then book six uh, is more timely than uh, we could have imagined. It's about plagues and pandemics, which has been mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating to research. And I'll tell you the parallels uh, and the, the connections to our modern times really researching all of these topics have been so, so interesting, but particularly with plagues and pandemics, um, you know, there were anti-vaccine, anti-science people around when Jenner was developing the smallpox vaccine, which of course was derived from cowpox. Uh, and there were people complaining that it's, you know, it's not okay to inject people with something that came from cows, even if it does save their lives. There were people making cartoons of people uh, getting this vaccine and then growing horns. There was even a campaign to try and convince people that if they were injected with the smallpox vaccine uh, that came from, you know, that was derived from cowpox, that women would be out in the fields canoodling with bulls before long. So uh, the disinformation campaigns, uh, you know, some things never change. Uh, but really, it's been it's been fascinating, and uh, like I said, there are just so many topics that we're we're hoping we'll be able to explore. And so as as an educator yourself, um, one of the one of the stated goals in History Smashers is to help shape the way we teach history. I wonder if you have any thoughts or recommendations on how 
um, these books could be integrated into the classroom or into young people's lives in general. Yeah, I mean, I hope they'll be used uh, alongside and as a, a, a more current supplement to history books. Something that we forget is that our understanding of history is always evolving. You know, the past is what happened, and that doesn't change after it happens, but our understanding of it changes all the time. We discover new documents. We, uh, you know, discover new artifacts. We have new um, findings in archaeology. And so we're constantly getting a better understanding of history, just the way our, our knowledge of science evolves. So what I hope uh, will happen is I hope teachers and librarians will use this series uh, to supplement other readings. And I think one of our, our biggest goals right now needs to be to teach kids to be thoughtful consumers of media, whether that media is you know, something that's being said by politicians or something on the news or something in their history books. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to look at primary sources, but also to challenge those primary sources. You know, we have a lot of early documents from Europeans during the age of colonization that call uh, North America a, a desolate wilderness and say that the, the native people who lived here were not industrious. Well, we also have documents that directly contradict that and show that the people even saying this knew that it wasn't true. Samuel de Champlain uh, published a map way back in 1605, uh, you know, showing the area around Plymouth with fields and villages and buildings. Uh, you know, he, he had seen people fishing in canoes and they had even given him fish hooks. So I think it's interesting to, to present some of this to kids and really to encourage them to be critical thinkers. I think that's going to be probably the best use of this new series um, as far as teaching kids. Great, thank you. We have a question for everybody from the audience, um, and I will begin with Michael, but if you need some time to think, just let me know. Um, the question is, what is one book that you wish you had back in middle school that has been written over the past decade, so recently? Ooh. Well, it wasn't a decade, but I mean, the first thing that pops in my head is Harry Potter. Um, mm -hmm. Like, it, I don't... You know, I think that's an easy one. A lot of people will say that, but when you really think about what she created, the layers and levels and the world building and the characters and that you go through seven books and you don't feel like she blew it on any level is really <laughs> like, it's really a, like a magnificent accomplishment. Like it's, it's one of the greatest book, book series probably ever written and may ever be written. Like, it's like you were so caught up in this kid and, and his life and, and, and the marvelous things that happened to him. And even early, you know, later when he goes in through puberty and he's just a terrible, terrible jerk to everyone, you were still there. Um, with, so I would say like Harry Potter is, is, is easily – the best book series I've read, read, and I wish we had had that when I was a kid. I mean, we had, all they gave us was when I was a kid, they gave us the yearling. So this is a this is a bit of a uh, this is exactly up my alley. Sure. Right on. I, I can't argue with that. Um, let's go to the end. What about you? Something you wish you might have grown up with as a reader. Yeah, kind of along actually a similar line. Um, I'm really in love with the Children of Blood and Bone and the Children of, I think it's Vengeance and Virtue or Virtue and Vengeance. I forget if I, I'm mixing those two up. But I absolutely love those series. Um, I'm really excited for the third installment that's going to come out. Um, I'm a huge, and I've always kind of been into kind of fantasy stories. Um, despite the fact that I'm you know, a scientist and also appreciate facts, I really, really love a good fantasy. And I think growing up, I would have loved to see, you know, characters of color building, you know, this beautiful fantasy world. So much of the fantasy that was available when I was coming up was based on, you know, kind of like European style fantasy worlds, like something that you can imagine taking place in the Scottish foothills or whatever. Um, but having this world kind of be built almost 
you know, Wakanda style <laughs> was really, really fun for me. And I would have loved to have something like that um, when I was growing up for sure. Absolutely, good choice. What about you, Kate? I was just thinking that I wish um, the Anne series had been around. I was a kid who loved science, and, and I'm, I haven't read them yet, obviously, but I'm, I'm fascinated. I was like, oh, man, I'd like to go back and give those to nine-year-old me. Um, other than that, I was, a, I was a huge Ramona reader. I loved the Ramona books, and there, were, there could never be enough of them for me. Uh, so if I could go back in time and, and hand some books to uh, – you know, to, to nine or 10 year old Kate, it would be some of the, the amazing character based series that we're seeing now uh, with with great diverse characters. I love the Jasmine Taguchi books by Debbie Michiko Florence, um, Kelly Starling Lyons, Jada Jones series, um, and Henna Khan, Zaid Salim, Chasing the Dream are, are, you know, some of those that are, uh, you know, Ramona-esque in that they have great characters. And then also uh, just came out recently, Ways to Make Sunshine by Renee Watson, uh, is another character, even set in Portland, like Ramona, uh, but Ryan Hart is a character, and, um, you know, she's a, a, a great modern-day Ramona. Excellent. And thank you, Kate. Sorry, I just want to say thank oh, you. No. It was very sweet <laughs> and kind. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited about those, though. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Kenneth, what about you? What's something you wish you had when you were a young lad? I think it would have to be uh, Philip Pullman's Golden Compass, just for the sheer um, uh, magic and, and majesty and, and the sweep um, uh, and, and wonder of that, of that world that he created where everyone has, you know, a, a, an animal demon who's, you know, really their, their alter ego um, or soul even. And, um, uh, you know, there's witches and there's angels and it's this incredibly uh, rich um, world that he, that, he, that he cooked up. Um, I, I can't, I, I, I read it again just last year and it, and it enchanted me just as much as it did when it first came out. It's, uh, I would have loved that as a kid. Excellent. A lot of love for fantasy here. I like that. Mm. And that is all the time we have, folks. Thank you so much for answering some questions. Yeah, thank you. It was so my pleasure. Here. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Uh, thank you for including me. It was a big thrill. Thanks, everyone. We're so happy to have you. And so, attendees will, will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, certificate of completion, and video recording. And may the... <laughs> for more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming. If you haven't already, be sure to check out Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things books and library land. Did you know Booklist content is freely available to all until further notice? Start reading with our digital edition, a format that pairs the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. Interested in subscribing? Take advantage of this special webinar offer to get print, online, digital, and archive access to Booklist for only $99. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more thank you to our wonderful panelists and to our sponsor, Random House Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>